So this year's lecture series is virtual and is sponsored by our friends over at Papa and Barkley. So thanks so much, Papa and Barkley. We really appreciate it. And we hope that all of you will enjoy this lecture and will join us for our final lecture of the series, which will be on March 17th. This lecture is going to run in the same format as previous lectures, but I want to share a few reminders. As a disclaimer, we are recording this and streaming live on Facebook. And if we have any technical issues, I will request help from Ashley with the Sequoia Park Zoo Foundation, who is working in the background to facilitate this talk. And if for any reason your connection to Zoom is dropped and you're unable to reconnect, you can also join us over on Facebook and comment live as the lecture is going on. And if you're having trouble connecting to Zoom, you may not be logged into your Zoom account. And we do require participants to be logged into a registered free account through Zoom in order to participate. And you'll notice that we have our participants' cameras turned off and the audio muted automatically. And we would appreciate it if everyone would remain muted and with your videos turned off so that we can provide the best streaming experience for everyone. And then at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a chat button and you can ask questions to the speaker by clicking on the chat button, which will pop up a chat box where you can type in the question. And we will try to answer everyone's questions at the end of the lecture. And we will also monitor the Facebook Live comments and answer questions from there. So feel free to submit those questions as you think of them and we will save them and share them with our speaker at the end. And finally, during our in-person lectures, we do always pass the hat around to collect donations for the Zoo's Conservation Fund so that our zoo can continue supporting conservation work across the globe. And this year, we're virtually passing the hat by sharing a link to donate in our chat box. So you can click on that chat box and that will pop up a chat area where you see the clickable link. And then for those of you on Facebook, um, you can donate at our website which is at www.sequoiaparkzoo.net. And we really wanna thank our community for prioritizing conservation and making all these programs possible. It's really wonderful to be able to offer all of this. And now I'm excited to introduce Christina Ward from Save the Giants. It's a nonprofit in Guyana, South America that's working to save the endangered giant otter. Save the Giants was a recipient of the Zoo's Conservation Research Grants, and we're excited to hear their project updates. And Christina has worked in the animal care field since 2007 and creates artwork with nature themes to inspire people and fundraise for conservation. She worked as a wildlife rehabilitator in Georgia from 2007 to 2011. And in 2012, she began working with giant otters at Zoo Atlanta as a zookeeper, which inspired her to travel to Guyana in 2016 to help conduct her first giant otter population survey. And then after this trip, she began fundraising for giant otter conservation, and that led her to found Save the Giants in 2017. So she serves as the president of Save the Giants, and she has a Bachelor of Science degree in Natural Resource Management from the University of Georgia. And we were supposed to be joined tonight by Allie Kuhn, who serves on the Save the Giants board as a conservation biologist. But unfortunately, Allie lives in Texas and she has been without power or internet for three days and she can't be with us tonight. So um, we're really sad about that. But I do wanna share that Allie has authored a children's book that's focused on giant otters and it promotes themes of conservation and living harmoniously with wildlife and we really think everyone will enjoy this. And you can purchase this book on Amazon to help support the Save the Giants project. And we will share a link to that in our chat. Um, I was personally inspired by this project proposal and I reached out to Save the Giants as a volunteer outside of my role with Sequoia Park Zoo. And I led some of the technical trainings for this workshop in Guyana that they are discussing today. And it is my pleasure to get to share their amazing work with all of you. So thanks for joining us tonight, Christina, and sharing your expertise. Hi, thank you. All right, am I up? Is it me? Yes, it is. All righty, thanks. Ruth. Hi, everybody. It's great to have you here. Um, it's 10 p.m. in Georgia, but luckily I'm a night owl, so I'm all good. 
I'm going to share my screen with you and get our PowerPoint pulled up. So I will have to say this is the first time that I have actually um, hosted from my computer. So I think I should be good, but um, hopefully somebody will shoot up a flare gun or something if something crazy happens. Yes, um, we'll let you know if anything goes wrong, but it looks good from here. Okay, perfect. All right, let's get you in presentation mode. Still looking good? That looks great. Okay, awesome. All right, yeah, and Ruth said um, Allie was going to co-host with me, but she unfortunately is enduring um, snowpocalypse in Texas. Crazy stuff. Um, all right, well, thanks again for being here with us. My name is Christina Ward. I am one of the co-founders of Save the Giants. Um, we are a nonprofit, community-driven conservation organization. Uh, we're dedicated to preserving Guyana's wildlife through a multidisciplinary approach. And our focal species for this project is the critically endangered giant otter. All right, so why giant otters? We'll just start there. I'm going to try to minimize my screen over here. There we go. Why giant otters? Well, let's see. All right, so giant otters are a critically endangered indicator species in Guyana. Um, not only are they listed as endangered, but they are also poorly studied throughout much of their region, region which does include Guyana. Um, population estimates are limited and uh, distribution-wide um, management plans have been implemented in only a very few countries. Um, as an indicator, indicator species, uh, we know that if giant otters are in the area, that it's safe to say that our water quality is probably high. Um, we have an abundance of fish. And um, when the otters start leaving an area, that's when you really want to start asking the questions. Um, so real world application for this is um, villagers in that region who, you know, don't have access to um, standard water, water quality testing. Um, these indicator species are extremely important for them. So I'll play that again. All right. Um, Guyana is one of the last remaining strongholds for this species. Um, and due to historically low levels of development, Guyana has um, stayed a stronghold for the giant otter um, with expanses of unfragmented river that are still intact. And um, this is really critical for um, maintaining healthy gene flow between giant otter populations within the territories. Um, however, the situation in Guyana is urgent and the development of mining, forestry, um, and the oil sectors are really starting to pick up and boom. Um, the IUCN lists giant otters as data deficient. They're incredibly hard to study, hard to track. Um, and without groups like us on the ground doing this work and info, um, giant otters will just continue to remain relatively underrepresented in conservation. Um, and this is actually all of our footage. I'll just go ahead and say that. We, this is all the stuff that we have actually collected in the field. Um, and the third reason we focus on them for this project is because they're awesome. Uh, this is just a fun little video. It's kind of long, so I'm just going to let it play for a second. Um, this is one of our, um, I hate to say favorite groups, but uh, this one particular group has let us um, reliably study them for over the past five years. And um, they're one of the few groups that actually don't really mind um, uh, sitting on the boat and filming. Uh, if we remain quiet and keep our distance, um, this group usually lets us um, enjoy them. And this is one of the big uh, giant otter um, holts and den sites that is located on the river. Um, some of the big aquatic conservation issues in Guyana, um, of course, climate change, habitat destruction, the wildlife trade, and um, the human wildlife conflict. Uh, this video is from um, some of our drone footage that we took in the field. Um, you can see kind of an overview of the Rupununi River section um, uh, that we, where we work. And um, you can see just the amazing um, watershed environment of the Rupununi. Um, during the rainy season, the actual river floods its banks and swells. And all of this land that you see in this video will actually completely flood over. And so what, what happens during the rainy season with these floods is this great prolific breeding ground for fish 
and um, other aquatic animals that um, live in this ecosystem. So the floods are a, just a critical part of, um, of this ecosystem. And with climate change and global warming, we are seeing some really disrupted patterns in these seasons. Um, so yeah, conservation is a human problem, um, as is the case in most places when humans are suffering. Uh, they turn to quick uh, resource exploitation um, to get by and to make a living. Uh, the wildlife trade of giant otters, we have seen a very dramatic uptick over the past several years. Um, acquisition of giant otters for pets is becoming more and more prevalent. There are some eco or I would say ecologists loosely, um, in country that you know, they, they know that tourists want to see otters up close, and so they will take them out of the wild to have them on site to kind of try to lure people in. Um, this is a cool video. When I press play, if you'll look at the left-hand corner, you'll see an otter pop up really quick. Um, just some villagers out here, you know, fishing and doing their thing and hanging out with the otters, which is so cool. Um, but there is a stigma that um, giant otters do overfish. And humans feel, you know, a lot of villagers make their living uh, from fishing. And, you know, they see giant otters' voracious fishing habits and they think, well, you know, they're obviously eating all the fish and leaving none for me. So that is part of the human wildlife conflict that exists. Um, so how do we accomplish our mission with Save the Giants? Um, everything we do is based on community conservation initiatives. Uh, we do giant um, otter river surveys, community education, and domestic um, animal health clinics. Um, involving community members in our plan is of utmost importance. Um, we do work to create jobs, um, identify leaders, and empower them. Um, awards and incentives are always important, and educational and capacity building opportunities. And we always try to keep in mind our end goal of um, putting ourselves out of a job because ultimately we do want to turn this project over to the locals and have the people run everything. And this is just a cute little video of us taking the kids on a little fishing hole trip. Uh, they really love it when we come down to see them. Um, we do host free community training workshops where we emphasize the role of otters as indicator species and just try to promote their importance. Um, this is our very own Ruth who just spoke, um, teaching some ladies about GPS um, device training. Um, and during the workshop, we had our first one back in November of 2019, which you guys provided funding for. Uh, we just kind of started off with a Giant Otter 101 and some small breakout groups. And um, it may sound kind of crazy, but the majority of Guyanese people have actually never seen a giant otter. Um, a lot of them do not have the opportunity to go out on the boat, um, especially the women, just not something that they get to do. Um, so yeah, after the workshop, you know, hearing about the otters, people are super intrigued and they want to find out more and learn more about the species, which is absolutely what we want. Um, these are two of our newly hired employees, Kelly and Lori, and they are super stoked to be on board with us, and we are so happy to have them. Um, the workshop components, it was a very involved um, effort, so we're just going to kind of break down what we did last November. Um, so yeah, we already talked about our education component. Here's kind of what a typical day at the workshop looked like. Uh, we had these funny sheets up because we had to block the sun. Uh, the projector um, was giving us a fit, but you can you can see the turnout. It's a you know a mixed group of families, and they bring their kids, and the kids sit with no screens and pay attention the entire time and don't make a peep. Um, so you can kind of see the difference in attention spans <laughs> in different parts of the parts of the world. Um, and this is actually our guys. This is Oswin and Shannon. They're two of our surveyors, and we let them present for us at the workshop, uh, which they were super stoked about. Um, they got to talk about their work and why they love it and how important it is to them. Uh, 
Um, we had people from all over the world come to participate. Um, the International Otter Survival Fund from Scotland. Uh, we had a guy from Mexico, Pablo. He was a neotropical otter specialist. Um, Joe from Paraguay, and then of course the village stakeholders. This is just a fun picture of Paul Yuxin. He spotted some neotropical otter poop on that log and he was gonna have it, come hell or high water. Um, of course the Scottish are big into football, as are the kids in the village. So um, when the Yuxins brought them these football jerseys, they were absolutely delighted. Yeah, there's always good times for all, as we can see <laughs> in this picture. Um, so another component of the project and the workshop was um, building and expanding our community environmental education programs. Um, the Wildlife Club um, is one of the foundations of this project. We just feel that when we support the kids, um, it just leads to a natural, uh, more, the more, more involvement of parents, which is what we want. Um, so yeah, when we work with the kids, the parents come out and we just start building these relationships and then um, makes it a lot easier to um, put into play these really critical education programs that need, need to be there. Making them some otter masks, super cute. Um, another component of our education initiative that we're really proud of is um, the installation of our inaugural intern Ben turned the intern from Scotland. He was fabulous. He came um, super upbeat and cheery, ready for the challenge. Mostly ready, I will say, because I think he brought two pairs of pants and zero bug spray for his extended year long stay in the jungle. Um, but no, he did an absolutely amazing job and he was instrumental in organizing and implementing um, wildlife club meetings. Um, we actually have a huge uh, turnout now to most of the meetings, up to 60 to, seven kids, 60 to 70 kids can come out for, for each one, which is, which is great. Oh boy. Um, so a picture of Joe with some school kids that came by to attend the workshop. Um, we let them paint a wildlife club sign that they got to put up in front of the library where they hold their meetings. So they really enjoyed that. Um, otter survey training was the bulk of the workshop, getting our folks in the field trained up to actually conduct the otter surveys. Um, this is a pretty intense training. Uh, we go over everything from, you know, basics of how to use a point and shoot camera to the in-depth uh, nitty gritty details of camera trap placement, which, um, believe it or not, is actually a science. Um, is that my screen kind of going? How's my video looking? Is it playing? Yeah, it's not. Sorry, Christina, your video isn't playing. It's queuing up, though. It looks like it, it might okay. start here. Okay. All right. Um, so, yeah, this is just a little quick video of Oswin, one of our um, field guides, and he is trying to channel his inner giant otter and figure out where to put that camera trap, but it doesn't look like it's going to let us play it. Uh, maybe this one will work. Um, so yeah, with, with otter surveying, it's, it's really labor intensive. You can be on a boat for, you know, nine to 10, 12 hours a day, traversing giant otter territory. Um, you're looking for all sorts of kind of stuff, uh, campsites, giant otters, latrines, um, holts, dens, and of course, you know, individual otters themselves, if you're lucky. But, um, you know, it's, it's not typical that you see them on every boat trip. Um, this is a fun little video you guys will like. Um, so this is a typical otter encounter. Uh, you'll see them right off the tip of the boat on the right toward the bank. Um, this is kind of typical giant otter behavior. They'll pop out. It's typically adults will pop out first and they'll do this periscoping behavior that you'll see. They'll grunt and snort and make all kind of fuss. And um, you'll have about 20, 30 seconds of really good photo opportunities to try to get capture their neck patches that they have um, on their necks. And then nine out of 10 times, they're just gonna disappear after that. So hopefully you got your pictures in before that happens. Um, and then the other part of otter surveying is just waiting. I mean, a lot of times we just 
camp out and lay low for hours at a time and you know wait wait for the otters to to come and bless us with their presence just a few more pics here um, on this top right picture where Ben is standing in front this is kind of what a, a giant otter holt looks like um, in Guyana they dig them out of um, existing tree branches and root systems so they're super resourceful and they can dig down um, like up to six feet so these dens are actually really expansive um, so the workshop results it was just a great experience for everyone involved um, we consider it you know super successful uh, we trained six new surveyors and hired two new full-timers like I said previously uh, Lori and Kelly and they are super excited to be paid employees now. Uh, we really are hoping to increase this number when COVID lets up. Um, you know, as with most things, it's put a giant wrench in our system. So we're hoping to recover, hopefully in the fall, and get back to full capacity. Uh, we had 35 total adult participants for the, um, the entire duration of the workshop start to finish and 85 youth reached through our environmental education programming during the workshop, which is fabulous. All right, so this next section you guys are gonna enjoy. Um, Sequoia Park actually um, gave us enough grant funding to purchase seven new camera traps for the field, which is huge. Um, and you'll kind of see in these pictures why camera traps are so critical to this project. Um, they just allow us to collect data that would be nearly impossible to collect um, manually. Um, so in these first pictures you can kind of see um, how well we can identify this guy right here with his throat patch. Each giant otter has a super individual, it's almost like a thumbprint on their neck. And um, it's really interesting. Some, some giants have this really ornate um, pattern like this guy has and then others have, you know, basically nothing, which makes it really fun to try to identify them. Um, Camera trap pictures, they can tell you so much about giant otter families, their social structure. Most of the time we can get a glimpse at um, gender, sex, to see what's going on with them within the family. Um, a lot of times we catch moms and babies, which is really critical to see how many cubs are you know, being produced any given birthing year. Um, and you can see here there's Presumably two adults, mom, dad, and then um, the teenagers will stay with them for up to, you know, five years until they venture out on their own. Um, and they actually help raise the cubs. Um, some made in here, taking a little nap. It's really tough to be a giant otter, as you can see. Um, we catch a lot of giant, you know, giant otter activity. They're moving into their dens, cleaning stuff out. Here you can see some spring cleaning. They're actually really clean animals and to keep parasites down, they're constantly purging the dirt out of their dens, um, refreshing things. Um, camera traps tell us a lot about uh, giant otter behavior in terms of like activity, what time they're going out, uh, what time they're moving, do they move at night? Um, and that's important for us to know when we are doing these surveys. Um, because you got to get out of bed. We got to know what time they're, you know, hitting the river and um, camera traps let us see all that information. Um, you can just, you can see different individuals and who they're moving with, who they're fishing with, where they're going to fish. Uh, this is actually really cool. This is a lactating mom and she's got her two newborn baby pups and she's moving them around and they just kind of follow her up to the den. Um, and then sometimes you just end up with really funny stuff like this. Um, we always say it's like Christmas every time you go and pick up a camera trap because it's like unwrapping all these presents. You just never know what you're going to get. The silly fella. And then sometimes you get unexpected friends. Um, we have an iguana here um, and then on this part, one particular camera trap, we kept getting this same neotropical otter, which is curious because um, it suggests that, you know, these species are sharing these dens um, and, you know, crossing over territories. Um, I just had to include these. This was a group of babies. Um, this particular group had four cubs this year, and they were just so big and bulky, and they were just the funniest looking guys, so... 
I decided to include that. And you can just see there. I mean, this guy's probably not even four months old, and his and his front feet are just huge. So what are we doing with all this data? Why is it so important? Why do we have you know all these? pictures of giant otters and we like to call it our um, otter Facebook collection. Ultimately we are compiling everything into a database. Um, one of uh, Bridget, uh, the, the vice president of Save the Giants, her husband is um, just a technology genius and he has hand built this system where we can I, put all the identifying information of individual otters into the system and link them with family members, cubs, um, how they move in the wild. And it allows us just to, to count how many individual otters that we have. And um, that will ultimately let us make projections about population densities. And then we're hoping to be able to turn this database over um, to the village for them to use and then to for regional NGOs um, so hopefully uh, they can use this data to make more informed decisions about um, land management. Um, all right, so the future goals as far as education goes, of course, uh, continue the wildlife club. Uh, we do want to expand into neighboring villages, um, just like with everything else, waiting on COVID. And um, like Ruth was talking about with our book, we are hoping to make another book some point in the near future. Um, one of our biggest goals for 2021-2022 uh, is the construction of a new science center in the village. Uh, we just desperately need more space um, to in increase the reach of the project. Uh, we need equipment storage, um, adequate intern housing, vet clinic work, um, and an electronics lab. Uh, so we're really going to be digging deep for grants and funding for the construction of that. And we actually took the kids out to show them the site of the new center. And um, if you ever want to have a good time, just unleash a drone into a, a group of, of children. It's uh, really something. But they really thought it was neat. They enjoyed it. Um, domestic pet health is actually a big concern for us, obviously for the actual animals and the people but also in terms of um, disease transmission b between the domestic um, pets and the wild populations. Um, as you can see here, you know, the, the pets are in great shape. The people just don't have access to, to vet resources. Um, they don't even have access to their own health resources. So uh, we do hope to bring down a group of vets um, after COVID and conduct some spay and neuter clinics in the village to kind of curb these uh, booming populations of cats and dogs. All right, so how can you support us? Of course, um, please visit us on our social media um, outlets. That really helps us a lot. Um, our website, savethegiants.org. I have an online shop, colorsforconservation.com with some giant otter t-shirts and stickers. And, um, one of the best ways to support the project is to join us in the field, obviously, when it's safe for um, us to return. And as a consolation prize for attending tonight, I just want to say thank you and show you this video. Um, this was back in November. It was our last day in the country, and uh, we were on our final uh, boat uh, tour of the trip. And... Lo and behold, we get out and we look to our right and there is a jaguar on the bank. I guess she was just going in from, from her, you know, nightly hunt or whatever, but she was just hanging out on this bank and she actually let us hang out with her for about, um, about 30 minutes. We got a drone over there and um, checked her out and said hello and then she eventually kind of took off. You can, you can barely see her. Maybe, oh, you can see her right there at the top. Yeah, watch the, maybe we can post another video of her. That one was kind of lackluster. But yeah, I think that's all I have. So I'd love to take some questions and get some feedback. Well, thank you so much, Christina. Um, I want to share some of the questions from our Zoom chat and from the Facebook Live comments. Um, as a reminder, this lecture series is possible thanks to the sponsorship of Papa and Barkley and our 
Other conservation programs would not be possible without your help. So um, check out the link we've got posted in our Zoom chat to make donations to our conservation fund and to purchase books from the Save the Giants group. Um, Christina, we do have some questions here. All right. We have several folks wondering what are some of the differences between the giant river otters of Guyana and our North American river otters that we're used to seeing around here, especially the difference in size. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there's a substantial size difference. Um, giants can grow up to about six feet in length from head to tail and weigh close to 100, over 100 pounds. Um, so that's quite a difference from our, our little neos here, our, our um, little narrows here. Um, I would say the, the one picture that we showed of the neotropical otter, kind of checking that den out, there that's a more comparable species to um, our North Americans that we that we have here. So yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I guess if you want to know in terms of like behavior, the giant otters are actually one of the most social otters. Um, so their their family structure is kind of comparable to that of um, wolves. So they actually have a nickname. Um, wolves of the river in some parts of South America. Um, like I kind of said before, um, parents stay together usually for life and um, they usually have up to two to four cubs every season. And then um, they actually involve the um, offspring from previous seasons in the upbringing. So teenagers are responsible for nannying duty. Um, we have seen some evidence of like wet, wet nurse, we think, um, you know, still, still collecting info on that. Um, but yeah, so they, so they are a lot different than, than the otters that we have in the United States for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, Roland is curious, what is the estimate of the total giant river otter population? Um, so it's low. Um, like, like I said before, giant otters are a data deficient species. Um, they, they think maybe between two and 5,000 at the very top, that number. Um, but yeah, that's kind of why we're working so hard on this project, um, with the goal of establishing a more concrete population number for Guyana and then ultimately through their entire range. Yeah. Um, Ken would like to know, is English the lingua franca in the village? It is actually, which is great for us, right? Um, Guyana is a British um, settled colony. And in fact, Prince Harry actually came through there not too long ago and did the whole song and dance. You know, he did a tour of the villages and, you know, they dressed him up in his traditional um you know, uh, indigenous culture stuff, and it was a big to do. So yes, English is the first language. They do have um, several dialects, uh, Makushi, which uh, I would love to learn, but it's really hard to get any sort of materials to learn the language. Um, so yes, we do have a huge advantage with, with the language barrier. For sure. Um, Sherman is asking if we have a map showing where this is at. And oh, if we could pull one up, I I have one pulled up here that I could quickly screen share if that's all right with you. Sure. Hopefully that is visible. Um, so Christina, if you want to kind of talk us through here, but we're down in South America, you can. Yeah. See. So if you want to show, okay, so yeah, that's where we are within that circle. That's our region nine that we work out of and directly to the left, you can see Brazil. So we actually fly into Georgetown, which is at the top there. Yep. And then we will take a puddle jumper all the way to Lethem, which is on the border of Brazil. You could like literally throw a stone. Um, and then we drive back in two to three hours into the interior. Um, so every time we go to Guyana, the, the travel is super, it's just a huge time suck. So you have to allot, you know, four days of travel on either side of your trip in. Um, so usually when we go, we stay two or three weeks because it's just not worth it to, um, 
you know, try to go down there for a week. It just takes such a long time. And there's there's no roads through the interior, which, which is, you know, kind of a saving grace in a lot of ways. Um, there's just one big mud road that cuts straight through the heart of uh, Guyana. So if you were to drive, it takes you about, like, I don't know, over a day to get um, to the village. Well, that might dissuade this next question, but someone's asking is, uh, are there any summer internships available or are the internships usually longer term? That's definitely something we can talk about. Um, I know that, so we just put our intern in, like we were talking about, we put him in in November and he was slated to stay for a year. He did come out early because of COVID concerns. Um, the intern program, it went so well and there was so much benefit that we would you know, ideally like to keep that going. Um, there's a lot of different factors that play into an internship. It's really hard to put somebody down there for a month or two months because it's going to take you that long to um, get your bearings in the village. Um, so we do ask a minimum of usually six months to a year for an intern. But if you're I mean, we're always willing to be flexible and, you know, talk to people about internship opportunities for sure. Um, but it all goes back to situation with COVID because we really can't um, do too much planning right now with so much uncertainty. Sherman asks what the lifespan is for a giant otter. Um, in captivity, I wish we knew Bridget's maybe eight to 10 years, but in the wild, I would say probably less just because typical wild animals have a, a harder lifestyle than most in captivity. So I would say under, under 10 years and eight, maybe. I know there's a few otters that we've seen um, in our range for the entire five years that we've been there and some that have been on video locals have said that they've seen for you know up to eight years so yeah we have um a question from brandon do you identify each otter by the neck patch or are you also tagging some of the otters to tell them apart from one another i think he's implying with some type of a physical tag. yeah um so the neck patches are the most ideal way to um, identify giant otters just because they are super unique. Um, not one's going to be alike. Uh, there is one otter in Guyana that we have tracked for the past five years and we call her stripey head because she literally has a white raccoon stripe on her head. But that's super abnormal and she is the only otter we've ever seen uh, with a mark like that on her head. Um, a lot of them will have scarring from fights or, you know, getting into a tussle with a caiman, but those are going to fade. Um, so those are not a reliable um, indicator. Uh, as far as tagging goes, there have been, I think, three attempts to tag or radio collar the giants in the past. And we actually have the studies if you would like us to email them to you. Um, they all ended badly. Um, in order to tag a giant otter, you have to um, you have to sedate them and actually physically remove them from their family group. And in some of the cases where they did try to collar them and in reintroduce them to their groups, they weren't accepted back and they were actually predated um, because they didn't have access to their poults. So I think a jaguar got one of one of the females that they tried to tag. So yeah, it's it's not. It's not something that's really a common practice in, in the giant otter research field, unfortunately. Then we have a question from Susie. She wonders, has anyone ever looked at DNA and genetics from fecal samples? Dr. Ed wants to know. Dr. Ed, come help us with this, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have tried. I almost included a video of us um, securing some fresh um, giant otter poop samples. It was really exciting. Um, we have tried, and um, as Susie and Dr. Ed know, they work in Madagascar with um, II genetics, um, collecting the poop and fixing it so it's um, secured until you get it into a lab is always a challenge because we don't have anything in country where we can do that yet. Um, we don't even have access to like a proper refrigerator 
Um, so that is something that uh, we really, really would like to see happen. But until we have the right tools, we just have not been able to make it happen. And the, and the, the handful of samples that we did manage to get out of the country, it took us over a week and then they had to be shipped to somewhere in the UK. Um, and the lady who ran the genetics for us just said she didn't get much out of it. So I don't know, it was kind of a, kind of a womp womp situation. Yeah. Um, there was one more comment about the neck patches that might be of interest that uh, those unique patch marks are so important to study also because they're the same throughout their lives. Um, Bridget San Marco, who's a, a zookeeper at Moody Gardens, the vice president for Save the Giants, has these beautiful photos of otters throughout their lives. The same individuals where she's taken photos of those throat patches and, and matched them up. And it they've remained very consistent. So those are really reliable indicators. Totally. We have a question from Michaela. She wonders, meet about their social structure being more like wolves than our own local river otters, but are they similar to North American river otters in marking at latrines, making scat collection easier to assess genetics? Yeah, they're obsessed with poop. Um, <laughs> they, there's, I, I would, I would say the majority of our camera traps are located around otter latrines because that is their main way of, um, you know, marking their territory. And a lot of times I would say 50% of the time on the boat before we see an otter or we see a den, we are going to smell an otter. Um, it's very, very, very pungent. Um, and a lot of times what they'll do is they'll, they will mark the beginning and then the end of a territory, um, with these big dump sites. So they'll all just get out, um, I'm not really sure if a lot of you know about giant otter poop. It's really, really gross. There's no solids involved. It is pure liquid and um, some other like fish bones and it's really something. Um, but yeah, so they'll just create these huge latrine sites that mark um, where their territories stop in. They put them in front of their holts and it's like this whole uh, bathroom party for giant otters. You know, mom comes out first they all have to poop and roll in it, and then they dance with the trees and make sure everything's covered in it. So, yeah, it's not that we can't find the poop to send out for genetics, it's that we can't figure out how to get it safely and securely to a lab to, to run the, the genes. So if anybody out there wants to, you know, come down and play with otter poop, then, you know, let us know. <laughs> Adri asks, are you using any particular strategy to try to change fishermen's negative perception of the of the giant otters? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the majority of this project is really um, pushing the education component. Um, in in the in the workshop, we really took time um, during the workshop to ask them questions and let them talk um, because a big Part of our work is learning from them and listening to them and we actually did find out during this um this past workshop that one of the big complaints is it's not so much the otters being there they respect the animals but it's the fact that otters came in they get in their fishing nets and destroy their nets and when you live in a village in the middle of nowhere and have no access to to proper fishing nets a fishing net is an, a commodity to you so you, you can't really afford to lose you know, stuff like that. Um, so they said, yeah, we, the biggest issue is that we're losing our equipment. So, you know, we started brainstorming ways to help them replace their fishing nets or maybe like a repair system. Um, and really just, you know, uh, the wildlife club stuff is great. Cause like I said, what would the kids come out and participate? Then the parents start coming out. And that's really when we start having these, these really intimate dialogues about you know, their perception of the otters. And that's when we can have these discussions and really start to um, hopefully influence behavior change. Mm -hmm. We have a question. Do giant river otters help control pest species like the California sea otters with sea urchin? You know, that's a tricky question because I don't, I, Guyana's, it's a really, really unique ecosystem in the fact that it's almost pristine. Um, it's uh, it's really like no other place on earth. So 
as far as pest species, I, I don't know of anything off the top. I mean, do you know anything, Ruth, that rings a bell? Especially in Guyana. I mean, it might be different in Brazil and some other more developed places, but nothing. No, I, ha I really haven't heard anything about that. I will say this, from watching them, um, I think if there was a pest species, they would probably deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> because they're uh, pretty ferocious predators, so... They are. We have uh, observed stingrays being eaten by otters, which I think humans often consider pest species, though it, that's all in the eye of the beholder, but right. Yeah, yeah humans don't like interacting. Caiman, um, Caiman as well. Yeah, we've witnessed the older giant otters who are really losing their senses, um, maybe can't see as well or swim as well. They will just stop chasing the big fish, the fast fish, and go for easy prey like rays and, you know, snakes, whatever they can find. Sherman wonders if COVID has made it to this remote area. COVID has made it to Guyana, yes. Um, as far as it coming into the village, it's really hard to, to say how much of an effect it's had yet. Um, a lot of cases go underreported. Um, I know when cases were um, upticking in the beginning, the solution was to send whoever might be infected or possible exposure, send them to a local clinic in Lethem, which is the bordering city with Brazil. And if you went to Lethem and presented with COVID that you were put into, um, you know, like a COVID housing kind of situation, which wasn't great. And so it kind of created this fear um, in this negative feedback loop of people saying, well, if you're going to put me there, I'm not going to tell you I have COVID. I'm not going to get tested. So, you know, it's just this situation where we just don't know if it's how rampant it is or the effect that it's, that's having yet, but it definitely in Guyana and Georgetown is it, becoming a bigger problem. Yep. Um, who makes the decisions about the management of these otters in Guyana? That's also a tricky question. Mm -hmm. um, so for, I guess for our region and the village that we work out of, um, the Mara Indians do have rights to the land. Um, and that is something we're super, super, super grateful for. And we want them to maintain those rights. Um, however, uh, if you remember, I was talking about in the beginning with the big oil and uh, gold mining, it really is starting to, we're seeing a huge increase in the interest of these native lands. Um, because like I said before, they're in pristine condition and there's a lot of untapped resources. So the pressure uh, for the indigenous communities to sell their land to uh, large scale agriculture, mining, whatever, uh, that pressure is coming. So um, that's why our work we feel is so important because our data lets the, um, it, it gives it gives the villagers more arsenal um, against the pressure that people are putting on them to sell their land and exploit it. And this kind of ties in a, a little bit here is do you have plans to create an ecotourism program that would support the community as well as otter conservation? Um, and a similar question is, are there enrollment opportunities or jobs that we're creating for people in Guyana in regards to conservation? Oh, sure, absolutely. And yeah, like, like we said, that is, that is our main goal is to, um, you know, you have to give these animals more than an intrinsic value because for all of us here, you know, we love these animals. We want to see them thriving. We want to see their numbers growing. And that's just because we care. But for, for people who are living in a village and make their living off of their resources, um, you know, it's important to show that that animal has a monetary value. Um, and, you know, we do realize that. And that is the reason why one of our main goals is creating jobs. We do have... Um, five full-time employees now that we pay every month. Um, our operating budget is anywhere from 1300 to 1500 a month, which is substantial for a small NGO of our size. Um, 
and yes, it is our always in our future goal to continue to um, capacity build. And I go back to the Science Center that we just talked about. And um, that's actually one of our, our big goals for that center is to create jobs. If we have the center, uh, we can have somebody paid full time to sit and man the center and actually, you know, have a full time job and then hopefully um, generate more sales through um, craft sales, which would create jobs. Um, so, yes, um, employment is absolutely critical to the success of not only our project, but to conservation in general. And um, in regards to the ecotourism question, there there already is an ecotourism group, so we don't really need to reinvent the wheel down there for Save the Giants doesn't need to, um, that works closely with that village. Um, so so yes, there are, that program is in place, just not, not through us. Right, and I mean, there's only, you can only build so big, right, until you start, um, kind of going backwards and stepping on your own, you, know, you can't bring too many people in, you have to keep it small and um, sustainable. You know, there there are places in Peru, I did go to Lake Sandoval, that's, you know, one of the most popular tourist destinations to go see giant otters in the wild. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I don't want to see our, our region turn into something that big. I just don't, I don't, I don't think it would be a sustainable operation if we translated that to you know what we're doing um we have a, a follow-up from susie that dr ed says he will set you up with <laughs> rna later collection tubes <laughs> and thanks to quiet park zoo for hosting this amazing project and supporting conservation in the wild thanks susie we love you so much i can't wait to talk poo with you <laughs> and um Adri asks, could giant otters be considered a key species? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we say this all the time, like once you start learning more about them and watching their behavior, I think they're the key species. I mean, I, I feel like all the, the big documentaries about the Amazon, they always leave out giant otters. You know, the, it's the jaguar, it's the caiman, it's the anaconda. Um, but I just feel like giant otters never get their their day in the light. Um, so yeah, they, they're absolutely incredible species uh, for sure, and I would no doubt think they're they're at the top. I don't know if you mean like in terms of um, like an indicator species, umbrella species, or in terms of like um, like a predator kind of thing. Well, it would be yes to to both. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, they are. Uh, top predator in their watershed and uh, critical to that food web. Um, I, also, um, I guess we could also say that um, going back to your comment about how do we um, kind of break the stigma to um, about the wildlife human conflict, um, we do like to enforce that giant otters in the ecosystem means that you do have a nice healthy balance of fish stores. Um, so instead of saying, oh, well, there's so many giant otters in this area, they're eating all my fish, you can say, no, giant otters are in this area because you have so much fish. So kind of retraining that thought process is um, definitely an angle that we take. Yes, and that uh, person did clarify, more like, would it trigger a trophic cascade if that species disappeared? I would say absolutely, yep. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a question from Sue asking to compare giant otters to the Sequoia Park zoo otters in terms of weight and their heads and feet. And I will say our Sequoia Park zoo otters um, weigh about nine or 10 kilograms. So they're kind of two to three times smaller than a giant otter in terms of their weight um, and maybe, I don't know if they're quite half the size of a giant otter because their tails are also still quite long um right I got some they're a lot smaller it's it's rather shocking when you when you do see them yeah giant otters are literally quite literally giant <laughs> they really are <laughs> well me i used to work with um ascos at zoo atlanta the asian small claws which are you know teeny tiny little guys and we got rid of those to move in the giant otters and it was just 
you know, like Chihuahua to Great Dane overnight in terms of, you know, the size and the, the change. But yeah, their, their heads, I, I guess we could talk about, I mean, if you imagine like the uh, North American river otters eating a small trout, you know, that would be like a big meal for them. But um, giant otters can eat huge piranha, um, you know, and just, you saw in that one clip I played at the beginning of that otter eating that fish, like it was no big deal. And they do, they can just bite straight through those fish bones and it doesn't phase them. Definitely don't want to get um, in an altercation with a giant otter ever. <laughs> and Carrie would like to know, are there many giant otters at zoos or aquariums? So yeah, giant there there are I think there's nine zoos in the US. I know they're gaining popularity just because they do look great on exhibit and they're a lot of fun to watch. Um, they're super active and social and make a lot of noise. Um, I know Atlanta has them, Detroit, Philadelphia, um, Texas, there's a handful of others. Um, but yeah, the population even in zoos um, is very small in terms of genetics. I think there's only a few bloodlines um, that are compatible in terms of like SSP matching and stuff like that. And uh, Carrie also asks, what are the giant otters main predators? We talked a little bit about but um i mean honestly i don't think they really have that that many predators jaguars don't you know every animal has a selected species that they're gonna predate and um i don't think any animal would be like oh you know it's giant otter hunting time just because they travel in groups um their dens are super secure like it's it would be really hard to get a hold of an a giant otter. Um, there have been cases where cubs can be predated by caiman, um, jaguar. Uh, we've caught multiple jags, you know, um, slinking around dens uh, through camera trap footage. So we know that they're there and they're checking them out. But um, jaguars are smart and they know their place. So um, they really don't have very many predators. I mean, always humans are the biggest issue, but um, yeah. All right, I think that's our, our last question. People had fantastic questions. We're so yep. lucky to have everyone here and engaged in this topic. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, Christina, thanks so much. We want to thank you again oh. for joining us and sharing your knowledge with us. So thanks. Um, did you want, did you have any last things you'd like to share? Hey, if you are uh, following back up on the internship questions, just email us on Christina at savethegiants.org. Um, shoot us a message, find us on social media. We're always happy to chat with you about anything you have in mind. Um, so yeah, just, just stay in touch, reach out for sure. Fantastic. Uh, well, as a reminder to everybody, we have one final lecture in this season's conservation lecture series. That will be March 17th. We are very eager to hear from Marie Martin. She's at Oregon State University. And she's giving a talk entitled Exploring the Behavior of Pacific Martins in Lassen National Park, California. So we are on the edge of our seat, ready to hear that one and look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, everybody. All right, thank you. Bye.